Okay, good evening. Today I went to, I was invited to go with two other monks to Buffalo, which is just, a, oh no, not even Buffalo, they said Buffalo, it turned out to be Niagara Falls, just across the border. And it was, uh, it was uh, a 50, 50th anniversary party for a Sri Lankan couple. They've been married for 50 years. So I was asked to talk about marriage, and then I was asked to keep it short because they were hungry, so I didn't, but I talked a little bit about uh, the commitment of marriage and how it shows uh, harmony, the ability to stay married so long. But I also mentioned happiness. Before I started my talk, I, I was saying, I know you're hungry, but I hope you're also hungry for the Dhamma, because food for the body isn't enough to make you happy. And so I mentioned and talked about happiness a little bit. And one of the people came up to me afterwards and said, Oh, I liked your talk, but uh, you didn't finish talking about happiness. And she wanted to hear more about happiness. So I was thinking about the talk I was going to give tonight, and I wanted to talk about goodness. And so the first thing I have to say is uh, the difference between goodness and happiness talk about the difference between the two because we we seek happiness we being just everyone people in the world and we come to practice meditation we're not immune to this our goal quite often is to be happy and we expect happiness from meditation we seek it out, and we see it as sort of the, the goal. Not always, but this is a common part of why we practice. And I'm not really saying that that's wrong, but it, it is kind of wrong. There's something wrong with it. Because while looking for happiness, looking for happiness, it's like, going out into an empty field and looking for fruit. It's an, sort of an absurdity, right? If you're looking for happiness, you go out into an empty field. I grew up in nature. We had 200 acres of land where my family had, and we had orchards and we had hay fields. But you can't find the you can't find the fruit in the hay fields, of course. You only find it in the orchard where the trees are. And so the point being that in order to be happy, you need something. You need to do something to be happy. There's something you need to cultivate to be happy. Is that the air conditioner? Can you turn it off? Yeah, it takes a minute. In order to be happy, you need there's something you need to do. So instead of searching for happiness, and let's say instead of cultivating happiness, 
Mm, that's a good way of expressing it because that's sort of how we think of it as I'm going to cultivate happiness. It's like saying you're going to cultivate fruit. You don't cultivate fruit, you cultivate fruit trees. And you don't eat the trees, you eat the fruit. So you have to cultivate something that you don't want to eat, and this is the problem. And so the thing that we cultivate, if you guessed it, is goodness. We should never be trying to cultivate happiness, because happiness doesn't lead to happiness. If you have a bunch of fruit and you eat it all, well, that's one thing you can do with fruit, and you feel good, but then the fruit is gone. You're hungry. If you plant the fruit, you get fruit trees. So goodness is, I mean, this is an analogy. I'm not going to stretch it too far, but the idea is if you pr cultivate goodness, the fruit is happiness. And this is important. We don't talk about goodness all that much. Uh, but it's a very good way to uh, make this much more uh, palatable and and easy to easy to understand easy to we make it more human when we talk about goodness instead of talking about wisdom and, and mindfulness and all these good qualities when we frame them as being goodness I think it really helps us to understand what the goal is and to to, to reorient ourselves in the right direction Understanding that goodness is important is, is, is key in helping us develop things like mindfulness and concentration, wisdom, that sort of thing. So the Buddha talked about the various kinds of goodness, and we can think of them as our trees. We're planting these trees and cultivating them. And tonight I'm going to talk about the ten types of goodness, so we think of them as ten trees. This is our orchard. If we, if we plant and cultivate, care for, water, prune and so on, all of the trees of goodness, then the fruit is happiness. Hey, putting aside the analogies, quite simply, it's goodness that leads to happiness. It's not happiness that leads to happiness. And so we often, we often put aside goodness in our lives, finding it fruitless, finding it uh, burdensome, artificial, often tied to religion, dogma, uh, often associated with naivety, when you let people walk all over you because you're a goody two-shoes, or you do good because you, of your ego, because you want to be seen as good for your reputation, that sort of thing. Which all just speaks to an, a lack of understanding, appreciation, and familiarity with goodness, with true goodness. Doesn't, det det doesn't detract from the goodness of goodness. So uh, we have to think of it like this and understand that the, the actual definition of goodness is that which leads to happiness. If we define it like that, then all we have to do is figure out what leads to happiness. We, we structure it this way so we don't say, I'm going to cultivate happiness, I'm going to just be happy. It's too simplistic. That's not how things work. Happiness doesn't lead to happiness. If it did, that would be great. You can try it for yourself and see. But no, it's, it's actually goodness that leads to happiness. It's a two-step process. It doesn't mean you can't be happy doing good things. But if you're just focused on the happiness, it will run out. Because it's caught up in, in desire and attachment and liking and so on. And, and all sorts of things that are um, corrupting our mind, even just ignorance. See, because the, the quality of goodness is not just to bring happiness, it's to make you a good person. It's to clear the mind, to purify the mind, to 
focus the mind, to calm the mind, to brighten, enlighten, and energize the mind, all sorts of good things. You know? That's why we call it goodness. So uh, we, we, we don't mean to say that do these things and good things will come. No, find the things, I'm not, gonna, not to specify, find the things. What I mean is, we're not saying become a Buddhist, that's goodness, or worship the Buddha, that's goodness, that sort of thing. No. I'm, I'm going to offer ten things to you and claim that these ten things are goodness. Not there may be things outside of this. I think there probably are, but these are ten good things anyway. Ten, the ten main sorts of goodness. I'll go through that. I'll try not to take too long. The first one is dana. Dana means charity, or literally giving. When you give things, when you're a, a giving person, you're a generous person. That's a type of goodness. Anytime you give, that's an act of goodness. And so it should go without saying that none of these are going to be the physical act. They are called punya kirya watu. Watu is a thing. What literally means a thing. Um, here it, it has the implication of being a method, a means, a you know a thing that you use for something. So kirya means means for the doing. Punya kirya watu. A watu, a thing that you use uh, for punya for goodness. But it doesn't mean that they are goodness in and of themselves. But you can cultivate goodness very easily. And charity is a means to help you cultivate goodness very easily. If you, if you give, it, it supports you in purifying your mind, in becoming a better person, and, in, and as a result, becoming happier. So becoming a better person, again, can be a very loaded phrase, and we have to, I want to be clear, I'm not trying to um, push dogma. The only dogma we're trying to push is, is this, charity, goodness, uh, generosity. So the brainwashing, I'm trying to brainwash you all. Brainwash you all into being generous. That's it. I, I admit, I admit that that's the agenda here be more generous because generosity is makes you a better person and by better person really just means a happier person not just making yourself happy of course but mainly so even here at our meditation center we we we're all here because of, of that sort of generosity and so recognizing that is is important as meditators, you don't really have a great op great opportunity to be generous um, with material things. Your generosity is more of a self-oriented, so you're giving yourself this opportunity, but you're also giving yourself over to the goodness, to the cultivation of insight meditation and mindfulness which I mean to say is a, is a gift actually to the world. I mean, it should never belittle the fact that you're here and think, oh, well, I'm here, I can't do goodness because I can't give charity. I can't be generous to other people because I'm doing this all selfishly for myself. This is really not the case. This isn't the sort of meditation that is a, a gift to yourself only. It's, a, it's very much a gift to the world because it's, it's difficult. People who come through this will, for, for the vast majority, even if they're unable to finish the course, the vast majority says it was a good, it was, it was great benefit, and they learned a lot, and they gained a lot from it. But I think the vast majority will also tell you how difficult it is, how challenging it is, how painful it can be to have to face and bear with present moment. 
so you're doing work and, and it's a great gift. I think we can include it there. But important to remember, and it's something that makes your practice easier if you're generous, if you're giving to others and so on. It, it helps you feel like a better person and so psychologically it has a great impact. It, it can make a difference between having a comfortable practice and an uncomfortable practice. Well, for all ten of these things, if you come here and find you haven't planted any trees, uh, you'll find you have very little fruit to eat. It can be very difficult to practice if we haven't cultivated goodness. The second one is sila, which means ethics or morality. And this is where meditators start to shine, because you have a very strong ethic. You're not engaged in entertainment or beautification or... Mm, you're, you're not absolutely not killing or stealing or lying or cheating, taking drugs or alcohol. You're not even saying bad things because you're barely speaking. You're, you're mostly by yourself throughout the day. So during a meditation course, sila is, is crucial. Dana is something, well, you don't have the opportunity and it's not something you have to put all that much emphasis on. But sila is the basis. It's the first of the three trainings. So keeping at least the five precepts while you're here, keeping the eight precepts is great. It's a great amount of goodness and, and it is because it's the sort of the, the partner of things like charity. Things like charity and others are, are positive acts of goodness. But they'll never survive if you're also doing evil things, if you're also hurting others and this isn't a Buddhist thing or a dogma thing, this is absolute fact. If you're cruel and mean to others, if you're, if you're cruel and mean to yourself or messing up your mind with drugs and alcohol or even entertainment, how could you possibly cultivate goodness at the same time? Your goodness is tainted by it, is hampered by it, is weakened by it. So there should be no doubt about these two really going together. They're really a pair, Dana and Sila. The third one is bhavana, and together these three are also called punya kiriyavattu. You don't have to go further than this. Basically, for, for a, a very brief teaching, the Buddha often taught just these three, and he called these the punya kiriyavattu. So bhavana means meditation, or literally development, um, or becoming even, if you want to be very literal. But it was used to mean giving rise to something in the mind. Not something, not physical bhavana, but bhavana is mental, mental bhavana, mental becoming, mental development is what is meant. It's another word for meditation. So we have two kinds of bhavana, samatha bhavana and vipassana bhavana. Uh, but you don't have to separate them. You can say there's there's samatha and there's vipassana, but but there's ultimately bhavana, and there are many kinds of bhavana. There's Metta, you can practice cultivating love, um, compassion. There's there's mindfulness of death or mindfulness of the body. There's many kinds of bhavana. So it should go without saying that not all kinds of mental development are going to be goodness, but it's a means. Using your mind, developing your mind without doing anything, or abstaining, or referring to abstaining from any, anything. Just looking at how your mind works, understanding your mind, developing your mind, cultivating good qualities. It's a great tool for cultivating goodness. So what we're doing here should be considered the highest form of goodness because just like I said with, with sila, you can't have dana, real true dana or anything like it, any kind of good act, including the ones I'll talk about next. And you also can't have sila, you can't refrain or abstain from evil if you don't have bhavana, if, you're, if your mind is not well cultivated, right? If you want to do evil things and you think it's good to do evil things, you'll do them. If you think it's useless or you're bored or lazy to do good deeds, to help others, stingy or selfish, you won't do that. So bhavana is how we overcome this, how we cultivate 
states of mind, whether intentionally creating love or kindness or whatever, or passively by just learning as we're doing here, getting to the root and understanding, oh, this is, leads to happiness, this leads to suffering, understanding the truth and, and naturally through the practice of insight, the practice of mindfulness, gaining the insight to see the difference between goodness and evil and, and naturally inclined towards goodness. If we do this, this is the, the means of ensuring the other two. So they really go together as a group. The first two support the third one, so it goes the other way as well. You, very hard to practice bhavana without dana and sila, without charity and ethics. Very hard to progress, um, but when you practice meditation, so in the beginning it's often quite difficult. When, once you practice bhavana, it very much helps your dana and sila. The fourth one is uh, apachayana. Apachayana means respect and humility. This is a great sort of goodness, something that I suppose we talk about. I don't probably talk about it as much as I should, but it's a great one. It you know it relates deeply to the idea of self and non-self. Conversely, the less you're attached to self, obviously the, the the more humble and, and respectful you can be. And conversely, the more you're attached to self, the less humble. So it's an ego thing, really. There's a great goodness for being humble. It, even when you do have ego and, and, and arrogance and conceit, trying to change that about yourself by being humble and respectful is quite useful. Being grateful, we talked about, I don't know if grateful gratitude fits in here, but we were talking about that in the car about I was talking with one of the monks about a case he was telling me about someone who was very ungrateful. He said, in Buddhism, Buddhism we put gratitude first. I don't know if that's in here, but I think it's a part of being respectful. I don't, I don't so much talk about gratitude, but I, I think more generally respect is important, even if someone hasn't ever done anything good for you. It's a good reason to help other people or to be nice to them, but... I don't think it should be the only one. What if someone's done nothing good for you? That means you should not be nice to them? I don't think necessarily. So I think, I think respect is a much better way of framing it. That we respect everyone and, and we are humble. It doesn't mean that you treat everyone equally or, or revere everyone or, or something like that. Some people you might just want to avoid completely but it should be humbly. It should not be because I don't deserve what they did to me. I don't want to have anything to do with this person because they are, they are, they are, uh, they are not pumping up my ego, right? It's just because someone humiliates you. Yeah, they, enlightened people can humiliate you quite well. They might be enlightened and that's why they're doing it. Even if they're not. If someone is very rude, mean, getting arrogant and getting puffed up never helps, doesn't help you. It's not goodness. Goodness is being humble. Humble means you can avoid people, but think of it as one of the trees and, and a guide for us. Because all of these are a guide for the sort of person we want to be. I think you can't argue with humility as well, that no matter what philosophy or, or background you have, anyone who says humility is bad and arrogance is good, I'm not sure how far they can get spiritually. I'm not sure there's any wise people who would agree with them. The fifth is vayavacca, vayavacca, vayavacca maya. Maya. Through Vayavacca. Vayavacca means, uh, I don't know literally what it means, but it means uh, helping. Kawan Kawai. Maybe it has, I don't know what the etymology is, but it means helping, it means uh, assisting. And so it can be assisting other other people in, let's say here in the center, assisting other meditators. 
Um, but I, I think generally it means assisting other people to do goodness, right? Something we may not, we may not have thought about. Right? If we think, I'm going to do goodness and what sort of good things I can do, well, one very important one. And it's important because of our interactions and our, our, the inescapable fact of our relationships with other people that we have to help others do good deeds as well. I think we have to, we have a duty, or, or it has to be a part of our practice of goodness. If we ignore it, we're, we have one tree without any fruit, a dead, the tree will die. We'll be missing something, something great that could bear great fruit. Being surrounded by other people who are doing goodness can only be a support for our own happiness, which again, remember, is the point. We should be very selfish and, and focus on our own happiness at all times. Problem is, the problem is, or, or the, the safety in that, that makes it not selfish, is that it can only come about by being very generous and very kind and very humble and content even. If you're seeking out happiness, you probably won't be very happy. But if you're seeking out goodness, I think you can never be unhappy. So vayavacca means helping other people do good deeds. Even just helping people come here, helping people when they do come here to our center, helping people in your community, your monastic community, your sangha, your, your meditation community, even just helping your family, relatives, friends, helping people, helping old people cross streets, that sort of thing. Helping cats out of trees, anything is helping. Yeah, I think specifically helping people do good things. So we talk about if you give, like giving money to a, a homeless person may not be helping them. Some people would say because they're just going to go buy drugs or alcohol with it and so on. And people would say, oh, I can't give money to homeless people for this reason and so on. Um, so it is important to note that we're talking about helping people do good things. And discrimination can be good. I'm not saying don't give money to homeless people, but maybe give them food instead or something. Or I didn't mean to pick on homeless people, but just as an example of how people, how there's a concern with helping people. You might help people do evil, like helping a cat out of a tree. Or maybe the cat will go and kill animals because now it's free from the tree. It's not that helping it out of the tree was wrong, it's just it might not be what is meant here by vayavacca. Because you really have to, to help people, help anyone, it has to be really helping them. Just feeding someone may or may not help them. It may very well be that there was a great lesson for them to be learned in being hungry. Maybe they in past lives starved other people or were stingy or so on. And so now being hungry will help them understand and be more compassionate. Not Again, not saying it's not good to help people or give gifts, right? That's another goodness. Only here I think we should pay very much attention to helping people do good things. Most of all. Uh, number six. Number six is patidhana. Patidhana, patidhana. Patidana it means, again, I'm not sure the etymology, but it means uh, Patidana means sharing, sharing your goodness with others. When you dedicate your goodness to others, this is a sort of a goodness. I think in a mundane sense we might talk about um, not taking credit for everything, but sharing the credit, you know, maybe acknowledging, you know, when those people get up on the stage with those awards and they say, I'd like to thank this person and that person. Well, they're the one who won the award, but they're sharing it. They're sharing the accomplishment with, really with those people who, who, who probably deserve it. That there's also dedicating. You dedicate 
to someone's memory, you wish to help them, even just dedicating to all beings. Why this is a great goodness, I think, is deeper than just... Um, well, it, it's, it's, a, it's deep in the sense that it, it changes the sort of person that you are. It changes the reasons why you're doing things. It changes your outlook and your goal. Like if I practice, when we practice meditation, we'll often at the end of it say, if, if someone sits and says, may this practice be of a benefit to all beings. May all beings be happy through this practice that I'm doing. May it be of great benefit to other beings. Is sort of a dedicating the, the goodness so we think of it, in, because we think of it in Buddhism in a fairly, often a fairly superficial way, like it's some sort of currency and I can share it with others. But it's, there's this uh, story of Anuruddha in a past life and someone asked, he, he gave some food to a Pacheka Buddha and someone asked him, to get, he, I want to buy that goodness from you. Transfer the merit to me. And so he went back to the Pacheka Buddha and he said, well, if I give this person credit for the merit, then do I lose it? Because he was just so ecstatic that he had done finally, in his, he was a very poor man. This was Anuruddha in a past life. He was quite ecstatic that he had done this good deed. And the Pacheka Buddha said, it's like a candle. If, if you have a candle lit and, and light my candle, do you lose your, your light? And he said, no, you could... You could light a thousand candles from it. So it, it, it's not a currency. It's, a, it's an opening of the mind, an expanding of the mind. It's like a currency that you can share, like light. You can share like the light of a candle. You can share again and again. But you know, in, a, in a mundane, it, it's sort of a deep... Uh, ultimate reality sense. It establishes a sense of purpose and a sense of the wishing of kindness and compassion and openness of mind and the wish to help, the wish for other beings to benefit. Maybe if you wish for the merit of the good deeds when you give something, you, you wish, you know, I dedicate this good, this good deed to this person or that person, it creates harmony between you and them. It creates love. It, Im it improves your relationship. You can do it for all the people who have, in Thailand, they'll often they have this thing they call Jiao Kam Nai Wen. Jiao Kam Nai Wen. So they say it, it's just the term Jiao Kam Nai Wen, Jiao Kam Nai Wen. But Jiao Kam means the owner of Kam. Jiao means owner. Kam means you know, Jiao Kam. Nai Wen. Nai again means owner. And Wayne is is Wera. It means vengeance. This uh, cycle of seeking revenge that they that this there's this idea that it follows you from life to life. So we all have Jaukam Nai Wayne. They say it's this uh, Thai sort of adaptation of the Buddhist teaching that that we have these things called these beings. We don't know where they are, but they're Jaukam Nai Wayne. But it could be anyone. You could be my Jiao Kam Nai Wen because uh, maybe I took care of you in a past life so now you have to bring me breakfast every day or something. Not like that. We, we, Jiao Kam Nai Wen actually works both ways. Well, Jiao Kam does anyway. It means we could have done good things in the past and that's why we've met. Maybe we were brothers, probably we were family and that's why we live together now. But we have bad relations, and dedicating the merit to them is a big thing in Thailand. You do good deeds and you dedicate it to your Jiao Kam Nai Wen. Anyone, it could be anyone who has your enemies in this life, people you don't know. They often attribute it to spirits, evil spirits who are causing them misfortune. Could be true, I don't know. I think it gets a little superstitious, but the idea is, I think, in the right place. For anyone who's done bad things, also wishing for them to be happy. This is an act of goodness. It's my intention to smooth things out, to better things, doing good in their name. It's called patan, pat, patidanamaya. Patidanamaya. 
Uh, number seven is Patanumodana. Patanumodana is the counterpart to Patidana. So Patidana is you share the merit. You say, "May you know, may this be dedicate? I dedicate this merit to this person, that person, to all beings, that sort of thing." Patanumodana is when you haven't done good, but you see someone else doing good, and you rejoice in it. When you see people meditating and you express your appreciation, your joy, your happiness, you affirm in your own mind that's a good thing that they're doing. You don't have to give, you don't have to keep morality to do goodness. You don't have to practice meditation. Even just someone on the street who, see, who hears about this meditation center says, oh, those people are doing good work. That's goodness. It makes them a better person. It reaffirms something good in them, right? This is all psychology, psychology, it's not magic and it's not physical, it's mental. So appreciating the good deeds of others is an important, a solid, a concrete form of goodness. It's not something that should be belittled, it should be a part of our orchard of goodness. We should not just do good deeds, but we should appreciate when other people do them. It's an important part because then it's not doing it for your image or to um, be better than others, to feel good about yourself. It's about doing it because it's good. When I do it, it's good. When they do it, it's, it, it's good. Because it's the right thing to do. Any goodness, anything that you've established in your mind is true goodness. Don't just do it yourself, but appreciate and encourage other people in doing the goodness as well. Number eight is Dhamma, Dhamma Desana. Dhamma Desana means teaching the Dhamma. Desana literally means pointing out or showing the Dhamma. So Dhamma Desana, I think, um, is something that is underappreciated. I think Dhamma Desana are not underappreciated. We appreciate very much when we hear a Dhamma Desana. I think what is underappreciated is it as a practice. When I was in Thailand, I had an opportunity to live with meditators for a long time. We had many rooms and we had people staying for months often. It was really great. We had the room for it, so we were able to keep people long term. And I really push them to start teaching. Teaching means instead of me giving a talk today, I want you to give a talk today. It's often very hard. People are, are afraid, self-conscious. They feel uh, incapable. And I think uh, it's, it's important to change that. It's important for us to understand not that you should give long talks about the Dhamma, but that you should share it with others. You should never be afraid of speaking the Dhamma. Speaking the Dhamma doesn't mean um, being, a, a, being an enlightened being, you know, being a Buddha or something. It means passing on the Buddhist, Buddhist teaching, showing it to them, giving it to them. Like me tonight, I'm trying not to pass on what I think of things. I'm trying to pass on what the Buddha said about things and what my teacher said about things and that sort of thing. Trying to pass on this teaching, which anyone can do and which is really a, anyone with a good heart, with a good intention can do and can begin to learn how to do. All of these things all require a little bit of learning if you've never done them before. Even just showing someone how to do walking meditation, that's Dhamma Desana, you're showing them the Dhamma. Showing them how, explaining how to do sitting meditation. Even uh, if we refer back to dana, a great way to give dana, to give generosity, uh, to cultivate generosity, is to share dhamma desana. Even if you, if you absolutely can't explain it yourself or, or describe it yourself, demonstrate it yourself, just giving a book or a, a video link or something like that to someone about the Dhamma is, is dana, is really the greatest sort of dana because it's called Dhamma dana, it's the gift of Dhamma. 
Number nine is called Dhamma Savana. So don't despair if you're not able to give Dhamma. Dhamma Savana means listening to the Dhamma. Listening to the Dhamma is another form of goodness. This is, I think, above and beyond the learning and the knowledge that comes from listening to the Dhamma. Actually, listening to the Dhamma is a form of goodness. It's a form of cultivation. It can even be a form of bhavana, a form of meditation. The act, the process of listening to the Dhamma, the process of uh, paying attention and appreciating and most especially internalizing and practicing, even as you're listening, you know, listening to a talk on, on insight meditation and practicing as you listen, being aware of the feelings in the body, the feelings in the mind, the thoughts and the sensations in the world around you, the experiences. All of this is uh, a form of goodness. The act of listening, the act of, of experiencing a Dhamma talk, experiencing a talk on the Dhamma is, is great goodness. Of course, just listening for information and the information you gain is a part of that. But it's not just the information, it's your quality of mind, the, the act of listening, the respect, the attentiveness, the inclination of mind is one of wholesomeness. And so absolutely the information that you get, it's important that it be a Dhamma, but it also has the effect of changing you and setting you in the right direction and giving you encouragement and straightening and stabilizing your mind and your practice. Number 10 is sort of to cap it all off and really hits, it really makes it very Buddhist, I think. It's called Ditujukamma. Ditujukamma means the act of straightening one's view is the number 10, the, the top sort of form of goodness. Dittujukama, straightening your view, the act of straightening your view. So this really comes from all the other nine. It most especially comes from mindfulness, of course. It really describes in a, in a fairly unique way what we're doing here in insight meditation. We don't talk, I don't talk a lot about view, but it's really our views and our beliefs that we're straightening out. Because everything, when I talk tonight about not having to believe in these things, that's really an important part of meditation, of insight and, and mindfulness. Is that you don't believe things, but you, you have something better than that. And that is your own understanding of what is good. I mean, I offer you these teachings, the information, and, and all the information about uh, insight meditation, mindfulness meditation. But it's only an offering. The, the actual work, it's only a pointing of the way. The actual path and the work is for you to do. And it's that process of straightening out your beliefs so that it's not you believe me or you believe yourself or you don't believe and you have doubt about things. It's nothing to do with that. It's from seeing for yourself. So I can guide you and say, look this way because you'll see better. And you can try that and you say, oh, it's true. And you do see better. And you see better because of your practice. So straightening of views Straightening of views goes deeper than just goodness, like, like charity or, or ethics. Uh, it involves a, a paradigm shift, a new way of looking at the world. Not just I should be good, but an understanding of the reality of goodness, and the reality of evil, and the reality of, of happiness, peace, suffering and freedom from suffering. This happens really every time that we're mindful. Every moment that we're mindful is, is sort of a titujukamma, an act of straightening the mind. Right? Because when you feel pain, the crooked mind, the crooked view, is that pain is bad, it's a problem. Even when we hear sounds that we don't like, or sights that we don't like, or smells that we don't like, it becomes a problem. Thoughts, memories, 
plans about the future. They become real boogeymen, they become real demons, monsters. But when you straighten, when you say to yourself, pain, pain, that's what you're doing. That's the act of straightening the view, straightening the way you look at things. No, it's not a problem, it's pain. Right? No, it's not a problem, it's sound, or it's vision, it's sight, it's thought, it's emotion. It is what it is. It is what it is, is this straightening out. So we get a one-to-one -one relationship. It's like this, and I see it like this. Not, it's like this and I see it like all these other things. That's not a, that's not a straight relationship. The straight relationship is one-to-one. -one. When you see it is what it is, there's such a... That's where freedom, that's the path to freedom, the path to purification. And that's goodness. The Buddha said... There's a very famous verse that I like to recite. Punyanche puriso kaira, kaira tenang punapunang, kaira tena punapunang, tamhi chanda kaira ta, sukho punyaso jayo. Which means, if one should do goodness, and if, if you're going to do it, and you should of course, you should do it again and again. The way to do goodness, if we talk about doing goodness, it's something you should do again and again. Puna punang. You should cultivate chanda. Chanda means contentment or an, an intent, intention, a, a desire almost, to do goodness. Why? Because sukho punya so the accumulation of sukho punya so happiness, is the accumulation of goodness. So the Buddha actually, actually, um, he equated the two. There's another verse that says, "Sukha se tang bikuve adivacchanang yadi dang punyani." Happiness is just another word for goodness. This is why we cultivate the trees, we cultivate the goodness. Because goodness, happiness doesn't come from happiness. Happiness comes from goodness. So, that's the Dhamma for tonight. Something that hopefully is encouraging and beneficial. I think it's a great teaching that we should pay attention to and appreciate. So, thank you for listening. <laughs>